So, und jetzt ähm, sagen wir Hallo zu unserem nächsten Talk. Welcome to our next talk with the title uh, Data Protection and Privacy for Citizens of the Uncharted Territories, which is uh, how Angela Merkel referred to the Internet. Please welcome our uh, presenter, Beata K. Hubrick. Thank you. I'm uh, very happy to be able to be here and to uh, talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is data protection and privacy. I've been uh, working in this area for a while now, and I'm here to tell you about the basics. What is data protection and privacy, and what is it not? Data protection is a fairly uh, new area of law. I can't really think of any younger ones. And we saw one of the results this year, in May this year, when the general data protection regulation came into effect. And I'm certain that all of you experienced this. And data protection is not simple. That's why I uh, am so happy to talk about it. I'm going to make all the effort I can to ensure that when you leave this room, or when you watch it later at home, that you're a bit more sure and certain um, about this subject. It's such a complicated subject because the beginnings weren't very smooth. The lawmakers never came together and told themselves we need to regulate this. And I'm going to hear all individual opinions. There were no Nobody was specialized in this and um, regulated it afterwards. In Germany, it happened on the f level of the individual states. First of all, in Hessen. And in 1983, the Federal Constitutional Court ruled that there is a basic right to data protection. So citizens have a right to decide for themselves who has their personal data and what they do with them and to control it and to improve it to not simply be object but subject so they can enter this process i will get back to this 25 years later the Constitutional Court reaffirmed that we have a second basic right. The right to confidentiality and <laughs> integrity of um, data systems. I think this room probably contains about 2,000 of these systems. And all of them are protected, and they are protected by our basic rights, because the Constitutional Court said so, and the Constitutional Court is the only court that can say things that become law. Um, so look, let's look at uh, more practical matters. I take my keys, my purse, and go out and want to meet with friends at a party, and before I do so, I maybe want uh, to uh, run some errands. I'm in private. I enter the street and uh, the my neighbor's house has video surveillance. That's a privacy and data protection problem because I must be able to walk along the pavement without being the subject of surveillance. Um, and the 
court ruled that this is correct, but the owner of the property has also also has the right to protect his property. So the compromise is that one third of the pavement can be under CCTV, but two thirds must not be under surveillance. And um, so I um, go to a cash machine to withdraw some money that's being recorded. Then I'm buying a ticket. I get get on the train. I'm on CCTV. Cameras see me getting on the train, sitting there, reading what I'm reading, getting off the train. I enter a cafe. Unfortunately, even cafes these days are under CCTV. That was different 50 years ago when you were able to uh, sit there on your own. So the public sphere is... Surveillance is everywhere in the public sphere, and I have to to understand that this is the way it is. And then in the evening, I um, go to a party. I'm still talking about what is data protection and what is it not. Um, and I meet some new people. And data protection is not that I, I'm not allowed to give them my email address or my phone number, but it's it's not um, data protection means that I can't talk about talk about talk about private data of other people other people just to entertain them. We have to anonymize this. I can tell you the most crazy stories of my life, and most of them do happen at work, at least when I uh, interact with other people. I can do all, th all those things. I can tell you those stories, but I'm not allowed to name names. I have to anonymize these. Many of you think, I'm sure, <coughs> that data protection is older than these few decades because there were always areas where confidentiality was important. For example, uh, when I visit the doctor's office, people have always visited their doctors. And there's an area between the doctor and the patient that is protected. by prof professional rules and uh, legislation. The same is true for lawyers and their clients. It's not data protection that is doing this. It's required for these professionals to follow their profession. Doctors and clients can't uh, doctors and lawyers can't work if uh, their patients and clients can't speak in confidence. Data protection means that whenever a third person has personal data, they're not allowed to use these to pursue their own economic interests. That's where data protection starts. Priests as well have this um, confidentiality but once a priest uses technical means, for example, to list who was born, who married, who died, and when they did so, these are protected data if they use technical systems for them. Because it's so important to reach a consensus about what we're talking about, there are certain terms that need explaining and that are explained by uh, by the law. I've taken four important terms that are very important to understand. These are personal data, then the, the subject, the responsible person, and processing. Let's start with personal data. 
data protection has a very well-defined area of responsibility. It's simply about personal data. It's not not about impersonal data. For example, the 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 location of a house. But um, once you, but for example, the person living in the house or the person paying the mortgage on the house, that would be personal data, but not its location. The law says that personal data that give information about relationships, about identifiable and identified natural persons are personal data, but not companies. If, of course, we're looking at individual people within companies, these are personal data. For example, if I get the business card of the CEO, that is personal data. But it's not. But uh, data about the company itself would not be personal data. This is a bit nerdy, but I um, would like to give you a feel for what personal data means and why nearly all of us should uh, think about personal data. And um, I will give you some examples. Names, for example, date of birth, age, address, email address, phone number, pictures, profession, nationality, religious and uh, political views, preferences, sexuality, travel plans, criminal records, these are all personal data. Income, capital, debts, property, for example, a house or a flat or a bicycle. The GDPR has extended this and made it more specific. It also includes all identification numbers we have, for example, the social security number, the uh, ID card number, passport numbers, and all the data sets that are encoded by these. IP addresses, this was a very long battle if dynamic IP addresses are personal data, but the European Court of Justice said yes, and um, that's that. Geodata are also very important, which we create every day. And ownership, so if I uh, rent a flat, I, I'm uh, in the German uh, understanding of the term, I own the flat or I'm, I'm in possession of the flat. Profiling, client data, personal um, staff data, health data. And the European Union also says that um, physical Physical, um, physical data, so for example, um, facial features or um, length of your hair, all of these are, are also personal data. And the subjects are all the people whose um, data is collected and used, so the people that are affected by this. The next question is what is what counts as um, information uh, working with information so um, locating information saving information and there's a joke from lawyers so 
So they are collecting um, ID cards and just collecting cards and information about people. They are not sorting them, so they are not working with them, just putting them in a drawer. And so they are not subject to this law. But of course, this doesn't work because they cannot work with these data in this case. So whenever you look for someone, you are sorting the cards and so you're working with this. So this law applies. It also applies if you are sending the information somewhere or if you're even deleting them. I just repeated the, the text of the law and the main point is no matter what you do with the data, you are uh, processing it. Yeah, so you can't wiggle out by saying, I just looked at it a little whenever you're processing it and whenever you look at it, you are processing it, assessing it already, then this law applies. So for example, a, a staff member is obliged to to do whatever the boss says, and so the boss is responsible for this. But if the staff member just does whatever they want in their shift, then they are responsible in this case. So whoever gives the order is the responsible one. And in that moment where you just hold your own counsel and you don't follow a direct order, it's your responsibility to follow the law. This also applies for the uh, punishments if you do something wrong. So now I explained to you the whole area we are talking about. And now we are talking about the structure of the uh, GDPR. It's, it's called a preventative um, so, so preventative, before something happens, it's already forbidden, but there is the option to allow it afterwards. Some laws might be structured differently, so it's primarily allowed, but it might be forbidden, but in this case it's preemptively forbidden and it might be allowed. This is a bit unusual in the German um, law system. Usually we are working with blacklists, so we ha have a clear list of things that are forbidden. And if something is not forbidden explicitly, then you are allowed to do it. In data protection and privacy, it's different. Also in um, building codes, because this is so potentially dangerous that the lawmaker, the European lawmaker in this, case, uh, in this case turned it around, as it was already in Germany before. So for the Germans, nothing changed. So in this case, since everything is explicitly forbidden unless allowed, you need, a, uh, you need permission by the data owner or the subject. There are four forms of permission. The biggest one is a physical contract and a written contract. Within a contract, you can collect and work with all the data that you need for this contract. The preparation of the contract, the finalizing and the uh, Aftermath of the contracts, that's the biggest biggest point where you can have a permission to work with data. After that, there's the agreement. So this is not the same as a contract. This is a different case. If you have a contract and there's data that you do not need for the uh, fulfillment of the contract, you have, are not allowed to use the data. And only outside of the contract you can work with the agreement. 
So the, the lawmaker says that all the subjects have to know what is happening with the data, who is responsible, and only then can you agree to that. As a third permission form, there's the um, law-abiding pledge or stuff you have to do to abide by the law. For example, you have to submit data to the financial um, offices. And there are different, very difficult questions to be asked. For example, if there are two conflicting rights, which one weighs heavier? So if something is, if someone whose data you have committed a crime, you have to weigh the rights, the, uh, the right of the subject for privacy and the interest, the public interest for punishment of crimes. And it's really important where is the status. So are you just in a public room or are you in a hospital? And you really have to check how, how important the rights are. And even professionals, uh, lawyers who worked in this field for a long time still struggle with this sometimes. And you always have to check why one right is heavier, weighs heavier or is more important than another one. And you always have to look for a way that does not hurt as much as other ways on the basic rights. One prominent example for this is the uh, law about copyright of public um, art. And this uh, and the question here is, when am I allowed to take a photograph of someone because there is the right of your own image? And the basic um, important thing here is the agreement. So someone has to agree to have their photo taken. And every photo, uh, photographer who takes pictures of pe people has to be aware of this. So there is usually no case where you just lose the right on your own picture. Especially if someone is in a private area where you're just amongst friends drinking alcohol and the stuff. It's really important to, uh, that you have this right on your own picture. And if you're in a public area, you, d you have less of an expectation, so you, ha uh, you must have less of an expectation that you are not photographed. So there's this distinction between the private area and the public area. And this agreement can have different forms and you must at least check visually if they are in agreement with this. You can't just walk around taking photographs of people because every person has to write on their own image and you can't just take a photograph of someone. And if someone is turning away or putting the hand in front of their face, it's kind of obvious that they do not want to be photographed and you have to respect that. And it's important to know that here you don't always have to react immediately. It's also possible that you after your photo has been taken, just react and tell them, no, I did not like that, and the photo has to be deleted. And very important, there is the, the job or the profession of a model. And if you take a picture of someone to advertise, you have to accept that the other one expect a payment of some form. And you have to discuss this and agree on a payment. And talking about this area where it's a current case, I want to talk about the, um, the law against uh, a bad, bad faith between competi competitors. So if someone if a business-to-business, business, if a business 
does something that is not proper in a common sense, then another company or business can address this in court. And in the spring 2018, I spent by listening to ideas and theories that with the GDPR there will be a lot of cases for the courts because it's such a new thing and there's three reasons against this. The, the go, uh, number one, the goal of this GDPR is not business to business interactions and companies do not really, are not really mentioned in it. And the lawmaker also said that it's about natural persons, so real human people. And because it is a European, um, European idea, there are also other laws that have to cooperate with this. But the main idea is to protect natural people. There's also quite a list that handles um, punishments and um, how to handle if something is breached and business to business is not really handled in there. And if a person, so a natural person, just some human uh, breaks the law, it's not really a thing that they are punished by or brought to court by another company or by any company. So this is um, a privilege of the state in this case. So this theory it is not, does not hold that the courts will be busy with inter-business topics because of this. Informational policies are also very important. This is not just data management. It's also where companies have to uh, tell you what they do. And this is necessary because there is no other way for you to know what a certain company does with your data. So what does, it, does the company have to tell you? They have to tell you what kind of data they, um, the company uses. Normally, if someone attacks you or takes away your property or if something ha happens to you in the real world, you will notice. It's usually nothing that happens without you noticing. But if someone breaches your data confi confidentiality or your privacy, there's no way for you to know normally. So the company has to tell you what they collect, what kind of data and then why. So there's, there's this idea that all data that, has, uh, that is collected has to be collected for a reason and you have to be told the reason. So every point of information is fixed, is linked to, uh, to a reason. So you cannot collect any data just for future use. You already have to know what it's for and especially not for private use, there has to be a reason and it has to be sensible. So when you know what kind of data is collected and processed by whom, and you do not like that, then you have rights. And you also have to be informed about your rights. So you have to be informed what is happening, what is happening to you and what you can do against that. So again, these points of information is who are you, where are you, what are your problems. And then you have to be told, again, you have to be call, uh, told what kind of data there is about you and what you can do about it. What are your rights? What are actions you can take? And how can you correct this? Basic rights are defensive rights, usually. 
Defensive right means a civilian is defending themselves against um, a public or uh, when the state attacks them. But of course you also have the possibility and must have the possibility to defend yourself against other private attacks. And these rights, you have to, to use them. Because if you do not want to use them, they just disappear. There are other people who fought for these rights, especially those thousands that fought for it in 1983 before the Basic Rights Court. In, in Germany there was a census and they fought against it in court and of course people before that and especially in this case they fought against the state collecting all the data where you live, who you are, who you're living with and so many people before us fought for these rights and we have to use this so at least I do it and We, we really should follow these people and we should use the rights that they fought for because it would be a shame if they went to waste. And of course it's difficult. And we have many areas where we have to figure out what's happening at all. So 80% of your time you have to invest to first figure out what's happening before you can do anything. So sometimes stuff is just told and isn't happening at all and you have to check what can you do and what are the tools that the law gives you to react to this, what's allowed, what's not allowed and how can you actually re react to that. And how can I... Um, How can I figure out a way to stay a subject and not an object in this data uh, data usage? So I'm happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. We have seven minutes for questions and answers. You know how it works. We have five microphones. Um, simply queue up. And if you're watching this online, this is not a problem either because we can now read you the internet. Let's start with microphone two, please. Thanks for your talk. How can I help others to take advantage of their informational rights, especially towards companies when they may not even be aware that these companies are saving their data, are storing their data. That's an interesting question. How can I help? The first thing you can do is always to give people information. Is it the, this about people you know or people you don't know? Well, my grandma, for example. You can... You can... You have to talk to her. You have to find out which con companies she interacts with. Of course, there are many, many companies attempting fraud here, or many people attempting fraud. I would uh, try to explain to her where the dangers lie then uh, go through her documents and check what company she interacts with and um, after that I would write to these companies and help her write to these companies and insist on your rights. So first you have to inform her uh, because I'm, I'm sure she doesn't know about her rights, she didn't gr grow up with these. and um, try to find out who, who you're dealing with. For example, ex certainly insurance companies and then 
ask them for the data and check if if it all looks right insist on uh, correction or deletion whenever applicable the young man at microphone one please you we're talking about the uh, you were talking about the cafe around the corner where i come from many restaurants and uh, small shops use several CCTV cameras and I think they would I, I think they have to um, inform about this in their entrance area and when I tell them about when I ask them about this they say that uh, they didn't they either are unaware of this or that the cameras aren't recording I'm, and I'm unhappy about this so what can I do yeah, both of their points are wrong the fact that they don't know about the regulation doesn't 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 do anything about the fact that these laws still apply people have to find out what they're allowed to do and what not i think video surveillance and cctv is a is a very old subject it's been talked about a lot these people using CCTV have to inform that uh, people are that they're using CCTV and even if it's simply monitoring so if they're just if, if they're not recording they have to do it still and um, the uh, there are government offices uh, to whom you can complain they're now independent and they all citizens can turn to these offices and uh, complain and uh, citizens have a right to uh, to a reaction and somebody from these offices will uh, get in touch with these people using surveillance and uh, we know that there are some uh, potentially very heavy fines involved so is that still true when the cameras are simply fake and the cameras are simply dummies When there's a working camera, then it's either being recorded or being uh, played back on a monitor. But um, dummies in the in the public sphere aren't that important because they don't have much of an impact. But in um, in closed rooms, they are because the people in these rooms won't realize that these are simply dummies but it's about it's about their rights so the rules are still the same i work in information security and there are some strong regulations tools in many companies does this apply data protection is there some, some awareness because the GDPR states that you must use technical means to protect data do company are companies aware of this because it doesn't really look like it yet yes there are in my experience and this is true and many people visiting this conference deal with information security i've never met a company that didn't have some basic security regulations for example uh, controlling access to servers not having uh, data on servers that are accessible from the internet and there are many means of uh, protecting personal data and the fact that this is known about in companies well, everybody who does infrastructure in companies who is a sysadmin in a, in a company 
has heard about this. Of course, it's not perfect. Data protection is is a moving target. It's constantly uh, developing. I've never seen a company where all the basics were missing, but uh, of course, things can go under the radar and be disregarded. There may be interface problems. The data isn't being deleted properly. So it exists, yes. And in the same way that technology develops, protection has to develop as well. And this protection is not simply technical, but also organizational. The biggest protection, uh, the biggest problem is, uh, is an unmotivated employee. I work a lot with employees as well. I, um, I do workshops. I'm, I'm always uh, available. And it's something that's uh, developing. So yes, this exists. I was wondering if uh, data protection applies to um, intelligence, uh, or no, to messengers as well. For example, WhatsApp, and um, if uh, messengers like Signal may be able to uh, circumvent these. For example, if you send uh, pictures of other people uh, or personal data via WhatsApp, what 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 uh, applies there? Well, the GDPR rules apply as well. But you're probably wondering why so many people are using WhatsApp, which is not always necessarily encrypted. And of course, the people using it leak a lot of things. And I'm not a friend of WhatsApp. I'm not a fan of it. For example, if you use WhatsApp um, as a teacher or in school, two things are needed. Firstly, you need to look at how secure the software is. But more importantly, those using WhatsApp or other messages must be informed about what it means. There are things you must never ever do. There are things that are dangerous, and that may cause damage. And there's a level on which you can use it. But it's, a, it's always a problem if you use it, for example, at school or at work. And if you, if you don't talk about it, if you don't think about what you're sending there. Christmas parties, for example, are critical or are dangerous because it's not simply about the when it's not simply about the uh, at the start of the Christmas party, but maybe also later when you've uh, had a few drinks and are, are messing about. And the problem there is not just the messenger, but also that these data are being um, are being recorded and sent. So you have to look at the software that you're w working with and you have to talk about what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Is there a legal way of outing uh, neo-Nazis? Yes, when the person is a figure of public interest, so if they're a if they're a figure of public interest, then yes, you can uh, 
you can uh, report about r report on them and um, report their data so this um, is by far not everybody but only those who uh, who uh, participate in uh, public debate thank you very much